Good morning, everyone. My name is Priya Saman, and my apologies that we were a bit delayed because of some technical issues in starting this panel. So today I have with me an um, esteemed guest from uh, the Caribbean islands and Malta to discuss um, about small nations. You know how how they are going to be recovering post pandemic. So I would like to open this panel uh, with Secretary June Somers. Please give me uh, uh, the privilege of introducing this uh, secretary. Dr. June Somers is the current chair of the University of West Indies Open Campus and, foreign se and former Secretary General of the Association of the Caribbean State. So Secretary, I would love to um, open this panel by uh, requesting you to give your opening remarks, please. Thank you very much, Priya. Let me say thank you for the invitation to participate on this panel. And I want to begin by saying that small nation states like ours in the Caribbean must depend on the utilization of all our resources, national, regional, um, multilateral, international, for us to be able to face the post-COVID world and recover. But even before that, let me say that we were in a, a very difficult position in the Caribbean, even before COVID-19. We had a number of challenges that we were trying to continue with during the period prior to COVID. So COVID-19 is an additional um, burden on the Caribbean. We are speaking about small, highly debted, indebted states, we are speaking about countries prone to natural disasters. And so we think that we have a chance now, an opportunity to be able to rethink our development. And I think that we have a strategic opportunity by looking at our regional organizations and how we can further deepen and widen integration because I think that we can only get out of this together. So as the former Secretary General of the Association of Caribbean States, I want to say that we have a strategic opportunity to work with all of the countries around the Caribbean Sea, the, the countries known as the Greater Caribbean, where we have an association of 25 full members and 11 associate members. And for me, it enhances the concept of nationhood because, as opposed to small states, because nothing small really gets any attention globally. And we have an association where the English, Spanish, French, and Dutch um, speaking countries come together to work in one organization, a cooperation body that really looks at functional cooperation and has coordinated a number of these issues over the, its existence for 26 years plus. The challenge with regional integration, um, though, for us is that in an organization like the Association of Caribbean States, we still have an inherent distrust because of size, languages, and political diversity. And over the last few years, I think we have seen a widening of the gap because of sustained assaults on regionalism and multilateralism. But the ACS has taken some very decisive decisions over the years, including ensuring that the Greater Caribbean is a zone of peace, that um, we advocate against, uh, against transshipment of nuclear waste through the region, and we help our countries to implement consistent development policies. And with COVID-19, we saw that happening um, in the early days, especially, I have not been Secretary General since last November, but in the early days of COVID-19, we had a series of meetings to look at issues um, like vulnerable groups in our region, issues um, specific to women. We had meetings, joint meetings between the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Health to ensure that these things happen. So I think an organization like the ACS with its image has the reach 
and the influence that we will need to to ride this initial back to development. Our countries are having a challenge. And um, well, right now, COVID, it is becoming very difficult for us to reopen our borders, yet we depend on tourism as one of our main um, drivers, economic drivers. So right now, for example, I am in the British Virgin Islands, in Tortola specifically, and we are working to ensure that the country can put in place a national sustainable development plan that will help immediately after the, the post-COVID period. So countries are starting to look at their development very seriously. Um, sustainable development will be the will underpin um, all the developments that is taking place, whether it's social, economic, environmental, and political, because this is still a country that is under um, colonial rule. And so we are trying to ensure that we can generate um, authentic transformation. And it is only within the regional um, organizations, I think, that we can see the kind of convergence that we need to be able to share our own experiences, our practices, to look at recovery solution and shared resources. And shared resources. I also think that um, organizations like the Association of Caribbean States have been involved in doing things like early warning systems, alert systems, strategic intelligence and inclusion, um, and strengthening partnerships globally. I think that will be another um, way for us to go to consolidate and converge with regard to how we approach the international um, community. So all of these things will come to play um, within organizations, the regional organizations, whether it be CARICOM or the Association of Caribbean States. But it will be leadership, it will take the urge to change the way that we do things in the region, having more of a people-centered focus when we look at recovery of our region. So these are my brief opening remarks, Priya. And as going to the discussion, I'll be able to hear a lot more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary. I mean, you know, there are multiple things that you uh, brought to the focus. One was the climate change. And second was, um, you know, about what we were talking when we started our panel, um, which was, you know, you were the former secretary, you know, I mean, uh, until 2020. So I hope we we get to see, and I'm talking in so the live audience hearing, and in 2026, we see a female secretary general at the United Nations. So with that, I would like to move to our next guest, Dr. Godfrey uh, Baldessino. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name right. And I just request um, the other speakers to mute themselves when they are not speaking because there's a lot of echo that comes. Uh, so I kindly request that. So um, uh, uh, Dr. Godfrey is the ambassador of Malta to the small states and the co-author of the handbook on the politics of small states. Also the pro-rector for the international development and full professor of sociology, department of sociology at the University of Malta and UNESCO co-chair in island studies and sustainability from 2016 to 2020. Dr. Godfrey, uh, we would love to hear your remarks. Thank you, Priya, and I join my predecessor in thanking you for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, and as has been said already, make the voice of small states heard or more heard, and in a positive way, because of course, this is the problem. Small states are very often faced by what we call Hobson's choice, you are either silent and invisible on the world stage, or when you make it to the news, it's because of bad news. I mean, most recently, of course, we've had the, the, the eruption on St. Vincent, and St. Vincent was in the, uh, the public gaze for a few days, and then suddenly His Royal Highness, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh died, and of course, the focus shifted completely. And all of a sudden, St. Vincent wasn't there anymore. Of course, we know it's there, trying very hard to manage multiple uh, challenges, uh, as if the COVID situation was not enough. Uh, then we had the eruption, then we had floods, and of course tourism is what it is. So really, we, we are in a situation where we need to, as uh, Madame Sumer uh, said before me, look at our resources and convince ourselves, perhaps above all others, that we have a positive message to spin here. Small states are ambassadors in themselves for sustainability, 
for how the planet could behave if it were behaving properly as uh, you know as uh, responsible players should uh, places that try to proceed on the basis of peaceful coexistence of their citizens i mean these are all very important values that small nations have carried forward over decades the the evidence is there these are stable democracies these are places where conflicts are less prevalent than in other countries where where governments are stable by and large where there's an altercation of power by and large you know these are all very very important attributes that i think the world should notice a bit more um uh, clearly and directly i also agree that this is a time where we need to rethink development tourism will come back but of course it's not quite there yet it will take some time moreover uh the g7 countries apparently have also reached an agreement amongst themselves to try to work for a global tax rate of 15% i'm not sure whether you are aware of this my colleagues but this is again this is not good news for small states because one of their competitive advantage of course is to offer low offer lower tax rates and widen the tax base by attracting other people to invest in their countries so we are facing here big serious challenges both in tourism as well as finance However, I think that the growing interest in uh, effective climate change is putting small states back in focus because of the green slash blue credentials that I think they can sport quite convincingly. This is an area that should attract uh, international interest. But however, it should dovetail with the development aspirations of the citizens of these small states. I for one would be the last person to believe that the agenda the development agenda of small countries is determined by others by investors who may be just looking for any opportunity to 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 sink money in things that have something to do with saving the planet we need to save our economies before saving the planet there is no future unless there is a present so i think as far as i'm concerned i may be provocative here but i don't mind i'm still learning the ropes when uh, in in dealing in the world of diplomacy but i ve- very strongly believe that we need to promote and support the development needs of the present be they education be they health be they infrastructure in order to have a future in which case of course let's go on and also support climate change related uh, initiatives thank you so much thank you so much ambassador i really you summarized it so well for the world and i think uh, this this line is going to this statement is going to go into the report that there is no future until there is present i truly agree to it so with that um, and uh, you know with a sense of time because i'm also keeping a uh, tab on the clock i would love to invite professor winston dukran to give his uh, remarks uh, professor dukran is the former minister of finance and governor of the central bank of trinidad and tobago so professor uh, please thank you very much priya are you ready yes we can hear you and see you just fine Excellent, excellent. Um, thanks for the opportunity to to share with such a distinguished group of professionals who are here this morning, and I want to echo what the uh, uh, former Secretary General of the ACS said, and was reinforced by our good friend Professor Godfrey from Malta, that time to rethink our development, and to to so do. I would like to raise one or two issues relative to that. One has to do with the World Economic Forum, since you have, to some extent, come out of that particular dialogue, and to indicate that the Global Reset Program has given a lot of, a lot of um, words with respect to inclusivity, but they have not really shown in practice. how small states and the right to have a, a rethinking of its development could be incorporated in that process and perhaps this will be an opportunity to make that point that if there is going to be a great reset as they have indicated that they must look at the unique aspects uh, as that has been identified here already um, and will be identified more so in your dialogue There are three aspects of that development calculus, um, which I'll just briefly put into the agenda. Apart from what we already know, is really this whole issue of 
digitalization. It is clearly the next chapter in globalization and the infrastructure that is required to have small states become an active participant and beneficiary of that is going to be a great challenge in the years ahead because I anticipate that there will be indeed a revolution in digitalization in the global economy and certainly small states will not be well served if it is left out of that both from the point of view of the infrastructure that is required and also from the point of view of the operating capacity um, of the enterprises in that area. The, the second area in terms of rethinking or development has to do with the financing issue. And it has been raised by, by both of the speakers so far. And I know the Secretary General of the ACS, former Secretary General, was a great advocate of this during her very productive years as Secretary General has to do with the entire financial architecture. I think in the post-pandemic era, it's going to be fundamental changes in how the, when the Bretton Woods Institution uh, approach that particular issue. And we must get into the front door in terms of delivering on uh, that particular issue. And I do agree with what... Um, my, my colleague and friend, um, Professor Godfrey and Ambassador Godfrey said that the G7 meeting that is taking place this week, I believe, in London, has already signaled that uh, a minimum tax rate is going to be placed on the agenda. And that is something that should not be allowed to take place without having the intervention of the impact that that will have on small states and the ability to secure the flow of funds uh, particularly the private sector uh, into the region, uh, that removes one of the competitive advantage that they have had historically. And therefore, what happens in the G20 meeting is of critical importance to us. So the issue of financing is, is important, and there's a lot that can be said on that particular matter, um, not only in terms of the reform agenda, but also in terms of the pandemic windows that are available. To some extent, the rigidity of those entry requirements in the, in the pandemic windows needs to be relaxed at this point because there is a sense that we can return to normalcy. I think we will be making a grave error if we view the post-pandemic era as a return to normalcy. I think rather than that, it's a return to a new dimension, a new paradigm of financing and the new paradigm of development. And I, I echo the reviews expressed so far that we should use the opportunity so, so do. And, and finally, in terms of, of the issue of, of development, um, I think the, the whole question of international cooperation. Um, I believe that the, the diplomacy that I, I sense that uh, that will become a critical issue that all states will have to find a new way to find a space in global diplomacy. Um, there are going to be floating coalitions in this period of flux in which we are. And such floating coalitions uh, must be promoted um, largely by small states and more specifically by small island states in order to be able to find an appropriate space in this period of, of, of flux in which we are in, in terms of world diplomacy. And international cooperation is going to see different parts of the world take different positions. For instance, Africa, of course, wants to ensure that it can leverage its presence, and so does Latin America, who do not want to be left out of the game. And of course, Europe is trying to establish a strategic autonomy, and, and so too will be countries in Asia trying to navigate its, its, um, its, its position with respect to global power shifts and trying to keep its distance from them all uh, at uh, comfortable places. Uh, and so too is the small island states. And small island countries must itself, within the context of that situation of global diplomacy and international cooperation, they wish to devise uh, an approach uh, whether it uses the existing framework 
that is in place it creates a new impetus. Um, my own feeling is that you've got to use the existing framework, but you've got to introduce into that framework a completely new impetus in order to find an appropriate diplomatic space. So those are some of the issues in order to rethink the development, both from the point of view of economics, from the point of view of politics, and from the point of view of development. Thank you so much, Professor. So um, I, I want to go deeper into what you touched about digitalization, but I would first like to have our uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Donald Baldev Singh, yeah. to give his opening remarks. Uh, Mr. Baldev Singh is the president of Inman Group and also founder of the Carbon Zero Institute of Trinidad and Tobago. So, Mr. Baldev Singh. Thank you very much, Priya. And um, thank you to Horasis for putting together this panel. I see that uh, COVID has exposed the soft underbelly of our delicately balanced economies in the small states. Uh, whether we depended on remittances or single dimensional aspects to our economy like tourism or in the case of Trinidad and Tobago, a low and subsidized energy price in order to support our uh, economic standing. Uh, what it has shown is that you remove one of these legs and the whole thing topples over, which means that we have not been living in a sustainable economic uh, system for a long time. And we've depended on aid and short-term measures to keep our economies afloat in the small nations. I think that as devastating as COVID-19 has been, it is but a dress rehearsal for the impending storm, which is climate change. And we know that this storm is coming. And therefore, what we have to do in post-COVID era is to look for the opportunities to reset the things that we've been doing and make our economies more resilient to be able to handle climate change. We also need to start looking at partnerships and move money spent through aid to investment with uh, bigger countries so that we we find viable enterprises to work with and rather than look for aid to keep propping up our fragile economies. So for example, in the area of, of carbon reduction, which the world has to do, we have in small uh, nations, large maritime jurisdictions. And therefore, we have a great place to sequester carbon. And the thing with carbon removal is that it doesn't matter if we take a ton of carbon out of the air in Austria, Australia, St. Lucia. It is still equal. Therefore, we have an opportunity for a business in removing carbon that is not location dependent. And we should not, uh, start looking at those kinds of opportunities. Ambassador Suma spoke about authentic transformation. Energy transition is an imperative in the world, and uh, we have to participate in it. As it is, we burn a lot of uh, diesel and heavy fuel oil to produce energy in the Caribbean, for example, and it's costing 40 cents US per kilowatt hour, whereas renewable energy is available at less than 10 cents, but it needs investment. So let's move some of that aid money into investment and work on the things that we need to protect ourselves against climate change and to participate in the, in the uh, carbon economy that is growing uh, everywhere in the world. Thank you so much. So each one of you brought some very important points to touch upon and, you know, that can become a panel in itself, you know, because we can go so deep and deep into into it. But I would like to start with uh, what uh, Professor uh, Dukran mentioned about digitalization, as I said earlier. So see, COVID-19 is accelerating the rise of digital economy. How are small nations embracing this trend? And can public pa pa public private partnership help in kind of taking uh, forward, uh, you know, uh, this whole uh, digital world and the digital economy to create entrepreneurs that can also tackle climate change? 
So, you know, it's an open question. Uh, we can have it as a form of a discussion. My goal is to at least cover two more questions uh, in the time that we have together. If I may start, uh, it's yes, a great please. question, Priya. Um, one of the great advantages of uh, digitalization is that it can make small countries, small nations, more competitive on the global scene, especially if they're trading in services. Because, of course, very often when we're dealing in uh, tangible ma material objects, we have so many, so many challenges to face. Raw material, uh, import, export, econo these economies of scale, you know, there are so many uh, issues to face that by the time the product is ready to go to market, it's, it's, uh, its price is uncompetitive very often. Absolutely. And the only way to, to manage to sell anything is by appealing to brand, you know, a brand, brand identity, which perhaps to some extent allows us to sell things beyond, beyond their, their real value. Uh, however, when it comes to services, and of course, uh, services is the name of the game. Uh, most of our economies are already very heavily dependent on services. And I don't just mean tourism and finance. There are many other services that we can offer. And that includes public administration, by the way. So here, definitely, I think we are on a cusp of a silent revolution. The, the great reset, the post-COVID landscape, could very easily be one where small states and the inhabitants and the entrepreneurs of small states mm -hmm. compete almost, I would say, on an equal footing with individuals from larger countries, better endowed countries, because the Internet, the World Wide Web, and the flair and the panache associated with a skillfully designed web page, a skillfully marketed and branded product, and so on, can really make up for, for huge uh, deficiencies and, and differences otherwise. I, I completely agree. Yes, yes, Secretary, please. Yes, I, I certainly agree. But um, one of the things that COVID-19 has made very clear in small islands, states specifically, is that there is such inequality that many people do not get the opportunity to participate in a lot of the technology-driven industries. So right now, a number of schools in our region do not have access to the internet. A lot of the services have been um, cut because of the, well, have not returned because of the hurricanes that we had recently. And so a lot of students are being disadvantaged. So it is only students whose parents can afford to get the internet or can afford to buy a tablet, or can afford to give their children the kind of access, who will make it and be able to take advantage of all of the things that were said. So we also have to look at the other side of technology and the fact that it can increase inequality in small island developing states. But I agree that it is an opportunity for us to rethink our infrastructure and how we do these things. Professor Dukran and uh, Mr. Baldev Singh, do you want to add something to it? No, I think um, both, both positions have elaborated very well in terms of what the opportunities are like this. It certainly reminds us that there are other uh, initiatives and challenges that are not necessarily climate related that need, that need addressing. So definitely bandwidth. I think it's basically a human right these days. We cannot no longer look at it as a luxury. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, a necessary uh, foundation for decent living in the 21st century, and especially for our kids, because they need to grow in an environment where basic uh, digital uh, competence and literacy is a, a necessary basis for their future competence. So thinking about the theme for the whole Horasis event, which is about shared humanity, um, we have to carry that beyond sounding like a very good catchphrase, but start making it real by sharing some of the things that exist in the, in the what I call the bigger countries with the smaller countries and give them opportunity. Because as uh, Professor Dukran said, digitalization, it doesn't matter where your shop is. It's there virtually on the internet. This conference could be staged anywhere in the world. So um, it is for the countries themselves to start to become proactive but with support from the uh, bigger economy. That's, uh, you, you know, you won't believe because my next question was going to be on shared humanity. 
<laughs> you know, I was I was going to ask that, but uh, if you want, you know, we can we can go a little bit. I would love to hear from the other three guests as well. So, shared humanity has definitely emerged very strong in these times, and you know, we are seeing it at various level of the societies and you know, countries at large. So, how is it happening in in the in the in the islands and the states that you are in, and in general for uh, for smaller nations? You know, how is uh, that? On. Anyone well, I, else? I do think that the entire issue of solidarity uh, has emerged um, among small states and among small and large states. Um, that there are areas of commonality um, in order to advance the cause of humanity um, that could come out of this. Um, and I, I do agree that this provides an opportunity to look at the new diplomacy of small states in trying to pursue a higher level of humanitarian, humanitarian goals. And to that extent, I think we should challenge some of the existing institutions, um, li like the institutions that are meeting now in the G G7 and the G20, which tend to hold on to themselves the power to determine the future of humanity, that this is not, no longer can be a situation that the prerogative only of the big powers. And the World Economic Forum, in my view, has a very important role to play, apart from simply becoming platitudes, uh, making platitudes in this area to allow the small states. Indeed, when you look at the numbers, they are very significant. And in terms of the quality of the of the involvement, I think it will be even more significant from what, what of course, um, Mr. Donald Value Singh mentioned earlier in the area of connectivity and in other areas. So I think we could link up the issue of 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 of, of humanity to the issue of a new diplomacy that will be required to ensure that the solidarity that is emerged can be translated into new public policy and not to be um, where we are in pre-COVID period where we have to simply take uh, uh, as given the positions of the big countries on major issues like tax reform and other such things. May I add that? Thank you so much. So um, I wanted to... I yes, wanted please, to please, add that on, one of the things that COVID-19 has done is to show us or show up the vulnerable groups within our societies. And in our region, we have a number of vulnerable groups, including migrants, people who are trying to make a living, moving from place to place. And in that category, you have to target women specifically. We have a, a lot of advantage being taken of female migrants. You also have the issue of indigenous people that none of us speak to within our countries. And I think that when we start to, to, to look at issues surrounding shared humanity and what is happening with our indigenous groups within the greater Caribbean, that we must give them a voice. Shared humanity must be about giving those who did not have a voice a voice. And we have to concentrate on doing that to remove that, that, that air of, of, of silence around them. And so I think that we have to think of shared humanity in a, by going to the lowest denominator, the vulnerable groups. And may I just quickly add that the diplomacy of vaccine is something that we, uh, we should get involved in much earlier than we have. Uh, as well as the establishment of the Index for Vulnerability, uh, a universal index of vulnerability, and that work on that should advance with speed. So um, I want to, you know, Professor Dukran, whatever what you said about vaccine diplomacy. So I just want to continue uh, the, the the further discussion on that point. So what do small nations uh, expect from the multilateral agencies, and how fast they can come to rescue during the pandemic? Because implementation is key, right? The vaccines have been made, but you know, the success would be told, or you know, can be the, the, uh, can be you know. Uh, uh, 
said that we have met with that success when they are actually implemented and you know people have that so with that perspective from a vaccine diplomacy perspective where, where are small nations currently well if i may start priya first of all when one looks at the uh, the rates of uh, successful vaccination around the world you will see that many small countries are actually among the top uh, successful uh, jurisdictions places like the Seychelles for example small population in the Indian Ocean 100,000 people uh, they they have gone ahead and vaccinated I think two-thirds of their population already and this also speaks to the closeness the relative closeness and proximity of uh, public agencies like public health agencies of course to the general population uh, and it's much easier to administer these vaccines uh, and have stations where these vaccines can, can be set up in places where populations live relatively close to the medical centers or to the polyclinics. The situation may be a bit different where you have archipelagic states. So uh, former Secretary General reminded us of two particular vulnerable groups. I want to end at the third. You mentioned the immigrant population for sure, especially women. You mentioned the indigenous population. I will also mention the remote slash peripheral uh, residents of our jurisdictions, because even though we may be small, if the population is fragmented and scattered over large areas of ocean, it's not so much a Caribbean uh, situation, of course, except in the Bahamas. But in the Pacific, it's the it's the rule of the day, right? There are many archipelagic states. Think of Kiribati, think of um, Federated States of Micronesia, Fiji, Tonga. Many of these places will have what is has a semblance of a kind of a, an urban uh, core, the capital city, but then the rest of the population is out far, far away. It's irregular transport connections, very spotty internet, uh, if at all. You know, so the, the, the circumstances that you have explained uh, in relation to the Caribbean are in a way uh, writ large in the very much smaller countries of the Pacific. So let's keep these in mind. These issues are very, very important. If we need to get our act together as small states, we also need to acknowledge the differences that exist within small states, in spite of our smallness, and to direct whatever resources we have and whatever resources we may direct from elsewhere in order to lift up uh, this humanity, this shared humanity, which is also part of the, of the focus of this conference. Thank you. We are carrying you, Priya. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, I was saying, does anybody want to add to this? I think it's very well stated. Uh, the thing about shared humanity is to understand that the problems are really universal. And uh, we, could, we can attack them from that standpoint. So COVID says that if, if you allow one small country somewhere in the world to uh, their COVID situation goes out of hand, it's not isolated there because they are traveling and they will come and they will infect your country later on. So even from a selfish standpoint, we must understand this concept of, of sharing humanity. Uh, if I could talk about the role of the multilateral agencies and in, in, in terms of priorities and partnerships, so I think that often uh, we feel that there's a solution that has been put together and it can be uh, applied everywhere in the world in the same way. And uh, that often becomes a failing of the initiative. If we don't think about the specific needs of the state at the moment, uh, for example, if somebody is drowning, we, we cannot talk to them about fisheries. We have to talk to them about a life raft. And once they get into that life raft and they're floating, then we can talk about sustainable fisheries and so on. So we must develop uh, the priorities and do it in partnerships with the, the small and the large nations so that we, uh, we take care of the problems of today while looking at where the problems will be tomorrow and preparing for them. And I think that has to be come from a, a deepening compact, a, a greater partnership between the, the small and the large states. And if, if anything, COVID has shown us that it must not be a, uh, a sort of a cookie cutter approach that we have developed in some uh, uh, developed country and want to apply it everywhere. What I found is that in terms of international consulting, uh, prior to COVID, when people could travel more freely, 
we had a lot of international consultants coming into the Caribbean and uh, telling us what the solution should be. Yes. When they were blocked from coming, the consultancies came to the Caribbean itself. And now you have people who understand the problems and are equipped to um, present solutions. Suddenly had opportunity and it's changed. It's more directed toward the needs are. So, you know, we have uh, now uh, three minutes remaining, but I want to quickly touch upon, uh, we discussed uh, a bit, we touched upon the women, we touched upon the indigenous groups, but, you know, uh, I want to highlight youth here because, you know, they are the future. And but in, during this COVID, uh, while, you know, they have become extremely, many, many have become extremely savvy with whatever materials they have in, you know, forwarding their uh, professional goals, what is also becoming an issue for many is mental illness, okay? Um, so in smaller nations, especially, that is a parallel pandemic in the bigger uh, countries, uh, you know, large nations. So is that the same issues that smaller nations are facing or is the face of uh, that pandemic looking uh, a bit different for you all, uh, for the small nations? I'll just keep it short. I think the pandemic has, in a way, developed a sense of alienation amongst people who would typically, as a kind of a default option, would look out for each other, would be mm -hmm. open to each other. There has been a basic fear that has been introduced from strangers, which has reinforced um, bonding social capital. You know, So mm -hmm. people are basically, they have fallen back on their families, on the people that are members of their household. But as far as bridging social capital is concerned, I think we've suddenly run out of this initiative, uh, of this human disposition to reach out to, to complete strangers. And it's a real shame because, of, of course, our populations, our dense population densities and so on, are, are best adapt to reaching out to people in such a way that they, are not, they do not feel that they are alone or left out. I would like to add that in the Caribbean, we are extremely tactile people and lockdowns have created a challenge for us, yes. including our young people. Who, and you, so you're starting to see more um, rebellion against um, the things that the protocols that probably would yes, help like to mask, save yeah. our lives with regard to, to the COVID-19. And so young people, we have to find avenues um, to go back to community, which is what we are used to in our region. Well said. Well said. Very, very well said. So we have a minute remaining now together. Um, so anybody wants want to add something? Uh, um, I would just like to urge that um, even before the pandemic, uh, paradigms for development and for diplomacy were tired. Um, the pandemic has now accentuated the need to change those paradigms. It will be a great folly if the world and if the small countries believe that we can go back to normalcy um, in this situation, because normalcy is old paradigms that have themselves been tired. And therefore, we need to use the opportunity to create a new set of directions and a new approach to paradigms for development and for the process. Right. So, I um, mean, you know, we we had only 45 minutes to discuss this uh, really, um, you know, much needed top, topic. What I have, I can conclude is from our discussion today is small nations do have a very strong voice, you know, and it's high time that that voice comes on the international platform. I mean, uh, so that's number one. Secondly, there is no future until there is present, as Ambassador Godfrey said. And uh, third is strong multilateralism is required. And also there should be synergy.